Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of The Next Page. I'm your host, Jim Cohen, Executive Director of Birth to Five. Over the past several months, we have been talking about how the initiatives and the programs and early learning uh, situations that Birth to Five has for children in uh, Wayne County um, contributes to their preparation for kindergarten and for a lifetime of learning and success in a career. Today we're going to take a more global perspective on, on early education and we're going to move about a decade or two into the future and look at and talk about how um, early learning or the lack of early learning uh, impacts the well-being of the community in general. Today our guest is Pat Heine, and Pat has spent uh, her career in either education, administration, or community leadership. And today she's going to join in the discussion and help us out. Pat, give us a little bit about your current background and, and why uh, early education is so important to you. I don't even know where to begin when it comes to talking about why early education is important to me. But let me start with two major roles that I have right now. I am the chairperson of the United Way Education Vision Council. And we will talk a little bit later about what that means. But United Way recognized education, and especially kindergarten readiness, as a huge issue in this community, this county, these two counties that United Way supports. So that's, that's one role, and we'll be more specific in a minute. But the other one that I think is interesting that ties to this conversation, Mayor Hutton started in 2009 a Council on Economic Vitality. And in that discussion, there are the leaders from all of the major sectors of this community, financial, business, organizational, higher education, the social services, uh, not-for-profits, government, all of those folks come together and talk about what it takes to make Wayne County economically vital and excited. And what we've discovered after the first three or four years is that we came down to the very basic issue, namely, education. Yep. And I know you, and you may have mentioned it on this program, people were saying when we were looking at the unemployment rate, my goodness, we are unemployable, which is exactly what you all found out. There were lots of jobs available, right. but we didn't have people ready to take those jobs. So then we had to back up really far to see why people aren't ready. And education attainment is a huge issue of that. So from those two perspectives, I'm very interested in early education. But can I tell you a couple of other things that Please do. allows me to sit in this chair? Yes, ma'am. Or that encourages me to sit in this chair? I served, as a number of people who watch this program may know, for 12 and a half years on the Richmond Community Schools Board of School Trustees. And two things that we did that recognized and acknowledged the power of early education. Back 10 years ago, we funded full day kindergarten for any and all children. That was not the practice in many school systems. Then we realized when teachers said to us, but people, kids are coming not prepared. They can't sit still. They have no vocabulary. They've had no experience with books. There were even kids who had never held a book or been read to. And these are five-year-olds. So then Richmond Community Schools decided we needed to have a preschool in every one of our elementary buildings so that we could offer that to the neighborhood children because we knew that was important. So that was one of them. But my business partner and I have worked with, the, this, is, this goes way back, the Kansas <laughs> Health Foundation. And the Kansas Health Foundation recognized that if they didn't do something for zero to three, they were not going to have healthy Kansans. If, and I can explain more about that as we go along. Sure. But that was my first real introduction about 10 years ago to the power of early education. Sure. So when, when I see you combining literacy and early education in a program, I think it's really powerful. But today, I think we need to let this audience really understand why it's important to the economic vitality and health of this community. Now, you mentioned the, the, the Kansas uh, situation. Um, there are currently uh, several longitudinal studies that are available that have been going on for well over 50 years now um, that really validate 
um, the impact um, and the far-reaching impact of early education, not just in, in, in educational mm -hmm. pursuits, but in criminal activity, um, health, as you mentioned. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of information out there supporting that. James Heckman, an economist from the University of Chicago, a Nobel laureate economist, right. has done a number of those research projects. Correct. And he was a speaker at one of the conferences we organized at the Kansas Health Foundation. And he told us then that for every dollar spent in preschool, you would save seven to twenty dollars later That's on. Right. Remediation is much harder, but the bigger cost is what they've discovered about those people who aren't successful in school who can't read by third grade and be successful later, is they're the ones who end up in jail and or so we have other expenses. That was a very, that was an important turning point in my education and why I was very proactive and supportive when Richmond Community School said we need to begin with preschool, at least with full day kindergarten. But shouldn't we go back and talk a little bit about the United Way and what we've discovered. Yeah, let, let's do that. Let's let's start with it. Well, you happen to be p part of the kindergarten readiness, and so I will turn around and interview you here in just oh, a, just a do. moment. But <laughs> the United Way in 2008 did a community voices study, and of course, the public said education is important, and we all agreed with that. Upon analysis, the groups that they put together recognized that kindergarten readiness and adolescent responsibility were important. And we need to talk a little bit about those because they are directly connected. Yes. Kindergarten readiness said that we want kids to be socially and emotionally yes. prepared. And that's where birth to five comes in. Yes. However, I think this audience needs to know what you are doing on the state level with that whole study. Have you talked about that on this show? No, we haven't had an opportunity to get to well, that. Well, this is that opportunity. And as, as you may know, um, the governor put together um, an early learning advisory committee um, about a year or so ago um, because, it, 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 as you mentioned, the statistics and the data are just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, in, in support of the value of, of preschool and early learning and preparation for, for kindergarten. Um, and there are several work groups that are part of this, uh, what they call the ELAC, Early Learning Advisory Committee. And one of them, uh, the one that I serve on, is the uh, family engagement piece. But we're looking into, as a group, we're looking into how we're going to fund preschool. We're looking into um, bringing, uh, when you reach out into the community, it's not just enough to say, hey, we have preschool available now. We have to go out and we have to meet with families. We have to get to know them. We have to get them to trust us um, and bring them into the, into the process. Um, a big piece of this is evaluating um, how we're going to measure the effectiveness of the program. Because mm. you know, even though there's a lot of research out there, there are plenty of folks who are always skeptical of data, and they're concerned that, uh, gee, you know, it sound, preschool may sound good, but is it really effective? Is it really doing something? So we're, 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 we're looking at several measures that are going to be used that, as you mentioned, are going to evaluate the social and emotional preparedness of a child, um, it's going to measure their literacy in terms of vocabulary, and it's going to me measure their intellectual functioning. So we'll be able to see, once we get this, uh, the, the preschool programs up and running, we'll be able to actually measure and evaluate the effectiveness of the programs based on these particular tests, so we'll know that our children are ready and that the program is effective. What we've discovered the state discovered this, that if kids didn't read by the third grade, yeah. they, the, the state said, well, they can't move on. Well, what we've discovered in practical terms is they can't read by the third grade if they don't come to school prepared for kindergarten because they start immediately when they come to school in kindergarten. Kindergarten is no longer let's play, let's play. and let's sit on the mat. Now, I, I, I might mention this, and that is that children who typically don't have early learning and preschool opportunities start kindergarten anywhere from 18 to 24 months behind their peers. That's 18 to 24 months that our school systems are not prepared to make up and it almost impossible to make up. Correct. And if you think about that, that is two-fifths 
of a child's life. Correct. And when you think about trying to make up that two-fifths, remediation is too, too expensive. We had in this county, I think even before you came to this county, way back uh, in 2007, something like that, we had an education summit. And Suzanne Morse from the Pew Research mm -hmm. Institute came, and she just offhandedly said, you know how many jail beds you need by the percentage of kids who are reading in third grade. And two business people, Vic Josie, who recently uh, passed away, and Rick Ahaus took that very seriously and created the Third Grade Academy. And what we've discovered is that the kids who require that more than likely, the Third Grade Academy mm -hmm. that is, did not have a quality preschool Correct. or quality child care. And I want to go back to what the United Way has recognized, that for kindergarten readiness, if they are going to be able to be socially and emotionally uh, prepared, it's not just quality preschool, it's quality child care. Correct. So as the public thinks about what they need to do, quality child care, the path to quality, and I'm sure that, that's for an, a, an entirely different program, but all experiences are extremely important. The other thing, though, that the United Way Vision Council discovered that you've already mentioned, the United Way Vision Councils are gathering of people who have some professional expertise as well as some opportunity to be a program provider, mm -hmm. an agency provider for you. And when we talked about what are the barriers to education, mm -hmm. yeah. the barriers to education were very general in nature. One was parental family engagement. Correct. And that goes directly to, and it is connected directly, quite frankly, to socioeconomic status yes. and other issues that parents have. You know, a parent who has to have three or four jobs in order to put food on the table, so that goes back to the big picture of economic health of a particular community. The other was the training of the frontline staff. That's hugely important because they are the people who work directly with kids. And yet, again, back to our economic question, frequently the frontline staff are the least well paid. Correct. And they can't live, so they have to move on to other things. And, and one of the things, let me interject something here. One of the programs, that birth, initiatives that Birth to Five has is called Supporting Care Providers. And it's a program that goes out and works with these mm -hmm. daycare providers mm -hmm. and, and preschool providers and helps give them some of the techniques right. and, and some of the education that they can't afford. Mm -hmm. Because to go to school, to get that education, to get early learning education is not cheap. And as we said, they're not paid well to begin with. And they have to be the direct, they have to work. You know, the child care providers frequently don't have substitutes or Correct. folks who can come in, and so they can't really leave, and, and they need to be there for a full length of time. You, you know, just as an aside, uh, you and I have been working on Ivy Tech's Complete College Initiative. Correct, yeah. And Ivy Tech Community College was looking at why some people aren't able to finish their degrees and their certificates right. at Ivy Tech. And one of the things they discovered was appropriate and accessible child okay. care. And so that needs to be another program that you have some other time. We don't yes. want to cover it today. But that's but that's it's it's a critical fa it's a critical factor. Huge. And it's the economic vitality group found child care and transportation mm -hmm. and you know accessibility to technology all major concerns as people work to get their education to be able to move up the ladder in any economic uh, opportunity and this is and this is the issue that, that you, you already identified this and that's that remediation is is a tougher road to go and it's much more expensive. The research indicates that if we put money into preventative measures, mm -hmm. the return on the investment is four times greater mm -hmm. than w what we put into remediation. And, and this is remediation. This is when folks are in that situation where they haven't completed their education, where they can't get a good job, where they can't find good daycare. So it, it all ties together. It all together. ties together, and I think that's what 
the conclusion that I came to this fall, when I was looking at the United Way, what I had learned in, in, on the school board, and the economic vitality, where do you begin? <laughs> do you create a county that's economically vital and viable, and that takes care of the other? It's, it really is a cycle. Which comes first? That's why this program is hugely important. People need to realize that you have to tie literacy and early childhood to the economic health of this area. But the third thing I want to mention that the United Way Vision Councils talked about is this community's attitude toward kids mm -hmm. and education. Whether it's apathy, they just assume kids will grow up and be able to do what they need to do, or whether it is just a lack of interest or lack of knowledge or awareness, I don't know. But that's another reason why this program is extremely important. We've got to make people aware that we have to pay attention to our kids and what happens to them. Yeah, I think everybody has always, I mean, I don't think you're going to find too many people. If you stop 20 people on the street, mm -hmm. you won't find one person that denigrates education, that says Absolutely. education for children is not good. I just don't think that people go beyond the superficial mm -hmm. concept and look at the impact that a lack of education has had on our community. As you mentioned before, and I want to restate this, um, back in 2012, Economic Development Corporation, Work One, um, uh, the Chamber, Wayne County Chamber, and Ivy Tech um, um, c conducted a survey of employers in the area. And what we found, and this was at a time when our unemployment in the county was at its high 10.8, 10.9, mm -hmm. we found that there were hundreds of jobs available, but they couldn't be filled because we yeah. didn't have qualified applicants. And we're not talking rocket science jobs, we're mm -hmm. talking unskilled and semi-skilled labor. So that's when people, some people, and I know this is when the, the, the CEV was impacted, recognized, my gosh, we have a crisis in terms of an educated workforce. And we identified, and we labeled it this way, educational attainment, which means graduating from high school and then moving forward to either get a certificate or something else, or just graduating from high school. The other thing, the job skills gap, that's where we recognize technology Correct. and manufacturing matters, which is a, another way of helping people get certification. And then quite frankly, and this impacts kids in early education, and that is lifestyle choices yes. of drugs or any of those things. And that has been shown to impact young children. Because yes. some of the kids who come to school not prepared, it didn't because they didn't have the experiences. Their environment was so, I don't want to use the word poultry, but I guess I will, just lacking or it had some other issues. So again, that's where it started all tying together. How do we as a community help kids who live in the environments that are not healthy, how do we help them? And we go back to parental education and, and all of those things. A couple of other things I though wanted to mention as we think about what employers said. Employers said they want what they kept calling soft skills. And quite frankly, soft skills are not soft. They are all relationship, they are work ethic. Correct. And how do we look at kids? Well, back to James Heckman. See, all this does tie together. Yes, you know. it does. Back to James Heckman. They did a number of studies on these kids who went to preschool. And early on, the kids who went to preschool had an advantage in regular education. But then later on, the advantage wasn't as great. So they started looking at the kids who were successful. And what they discovered was there, there were characteristics of behavior and attitude that made a difference in yes. kids. And when you look at why children succeed, there are such things as, and I love this word, they call it grit, yeah. <laughs> self-control, yes. confidence, optimism, a number of things that are the soft skills that employers want. And this is the social-emotional development Absolutely. that you hear people talking about. So let's take that concept of social-emotional emo development that Bertha Five says we help to instill and put it in a practical mm -hmm. application, and that's what you get. Absolutely. And 
you can develop that in kids. It, we all sure. didn't. Some of us have more of a, a drive than others. You know, they say personality, whatever. And but much of that comes from the environment in which they live and the way they are pushed, not negatively, but actu mm -hmm. actually pushed to be responsible Correct. and make sure that the decisions, the consequences of their decisions are real and that they can learn to do those things. And so the way you teach kids, kind of how you do it, is what results in those characteristics. So this is another tie between what happens in school and education and the workforce. So if we're looking at a pathway, because that's exactly what, sure. what we have to look at, is how do we start from the very early part instilling the discipline, the self-control, yeah. the optimism, the sense of hope that allows people to want to learn, not only in the early childhood, mm -hmm. but in school and, and beyond. So it's, it's all of that pathway that I think as a community we have to take a look at and how we can help kids get that. Sure. And I think that's where we talk about community support and community responsibility now a little bit. Um, one of the uh, one of the main factors um, that's that or formulas I should say um, for uh, setting up preschool um, in in Indiana is going to be that each individual county has to support the preschool financially. So all the initiatives that that the state are putting forth um, are matching grant situations so that the state will give us half of the money, but the community has to come up mm -hmm. with half of the money. And what's interesting is there's a caveat on that money. It can't become, it can't originate as tax dollars, state dollars, or federal dollars. So it, literally, we have to start depending on our community. Mm -hmm. Our community has to start <laughs> stepping up here to help educate our children, literally. And the first step is to be aware that it makes a difference. Yes. You know, this past week, and I don't know exactly when this will air, it will air several times yeah. probably, but the early part of December, the White House sponsored yeah. an early childhood summit. Now, what you also need to know is that in 2009, Richmond, Indiana was an All-America City, and the All-America City application came from kids because it, the mayor said she wants to make sure that Richmond is a place where kids' dreams come true. Right. And so th there was a group of kids gathered to create the vision and to take a look at, because the All-America City isn't all about aesthetics. It is how does a community identify its challenges and work together to make it happen. Right. So when these young people looked at the vision they wanted, here the barriers they found to kids' success were quite interesting. One, people don't respect kids. and But the, the way that we are looking at that, you know, Kid Fest and some other things that especially Fonda Wilds mm -hmm. works with. The other was poverty that there are kids who don't have what other kids have. It's true. And the third piece was graduation rate. And what they identified was the people who didn't graduate often didn't read. And that's when the success of the third grade academy was touted as a way to meet that issue. Fast forward just a bit. After we won the All-America City Award, the National Civic League decided to partner with the United Way of America, a couple of other major organizations, to say maybe we ought to look at this thing that they've identified. So they came, all, the National Civic League came to Richmond to interview Vic and Rick about the third grade academy. And it became a model prototype for what they wanted to do. And it was so exciting to see on the national level people recognizing that you had to learn to read by third grade and early learning was important. And there has become a national movement and the people involved in that national movement then not only attended but partnered with the White House and some very powerful statements came out of that summit this past week. So what we need to do in Richmond is to be proud that we've identified these yes. issues 
But we have to step up even more than Rick and Vic and the third grade academy and other people have done to really become not only aware, educate ourselves, and then begin to support the efforts that you mentioned. And, and I'm very hopeful because in the last couple of years, um, the collaborative effort um, by just many different quarters of the county um, in, in terms of focusing on education in the big, in the general sense of the word, in the way we're talking about it, from cradle to career. That's the kind of focus that we need and we have to keep, keep on. And, and one of the things that, that you identified is that one of the reasons we're making some headway is we've recognized that all of these different pieces are connected and that we can't deal with each one of them individually, but we have to take the whole piece of it. So we used to focus on uh, education in terms of K to 12, and then it was college, and then it was this, and then it was that. Well, now we've got to look at the big picture. And that's where the pathway comes in. Yes. And I think the other thing, what I learned at a school board member is we have to invite the community in because for so long the community didn't feel invited in. Correct. So I think we need to spend this the last minute we have together making sure that the community that's listening to this feels invited in. Absolutely. And and there if you pay attention, if you watch the the the, the you know Whitewater TV here you're going to see about and hear about many of the initiatives and many of the groups and the organizations um, that are participating in this in these initiatives to get ourselves together um, and we encourage people to show up at meetings when you hear that the CEV is having a meeting you're welcome to attend when you hear uh, that the United Way Vision Council is having a meeting we would love to have you come and visit with us and 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 we need people to step up we need people to become more educated about what's going on and to participate it really does take a village to raise a child and educate them Pat I think we could go on for at least another hour of course. And I want to thank you very much for coming and visiting with us today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's all for this segment of the next page. We'll see you next time.